subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello. Good day, good day. How do you do? Happy to see you. Happy to meet you. Good day, good day. Time for literature. Happy to see you, my friend. Hello there. And it's a good day. And I'm happy to see you all through my cameras. How have you been, my learners? I've been super energetic. I hope you are too. Great. Welcome to Senior High School R. Here on Joy Learning. It is time with Jamal Labi for Literature in English, SHS 1. It is a continuation lesson. And so, if you missed the last lesson, don't worry, there's going to be a quick recap so you catch up and be on the same page with us. So we are looking at Bats by David H. Lawrence. Okay, so I mentioned the review. Now let's look at what we did in the previous lesson. And so in the previous lesson, we took time to have a glimpse about the background of the poet. We learned that the poet has several books to his credit. And so we say he's a prolific writer. Um, he's written a lot of poetry, a lot of novels, a lot of short stories, plays, essays, and a lot of criticisms. We also learned that his works are heavily autobiographical, autobiographical, and the experiences of his early life. And so if you look at the poem Bats that we are going to study today, if you look at his other poem like Snake, um, you get to understand that most of the things he writes based on his experience, based on his encounters that he's pushed to write. We also got to know when he was born. And we learned that he was born in 1985 in Eastwood and died on the 2nd of March, 1930. Let's bounce on. So we got to know that um, he attended Bullville Boarding School, uh, where he won a scholarship to Nottingham High School. And then he worked small um, as a crack. And then eventually he became a teacher. I so, say, you know, teachers, undoubtedly, we do a lot of beautiful things. And Lawrence was also a teacher. I think I didn't take you through his full name. And so normally you will see D.H. Lawrence. The D.H. is David Herbert Lawrence. Okay, good job. Um, let's run over from his background. I think I've given you something small about him, okay? And so if anybody asks us, you are reading bats, the animal bats by Lawrence, who at all is he? Then you can say that Lawrence is David Herbert Lawrence. He was born in 1985. Is he alive or dead? He is dead. Good job. Now, some key elements that you will notice in Lawrence's books or his write-ups is the fact that Lawrence's works are written in lyrical form. So there's some kind of rhyme rhythm anytime you read his poems. They are also sensuous, and so they appeal to the senses, they appeal to the emotions. We also see that they are in the rhapsodic prose style. And so, where you are going to see a fully structured poem of, um, let's say, a sonnet, 14 lines, an octave, 8 lines, um, a sextus, 
six lines. When it comes to um, David Herbert, his style is a bit of rhapsodic prose style. When we say it's rhapsodic prose style, it means that it's quite lengthy. And so, if you are reading his poem, or you are studying his poem, it's like you're reading a book. A short story, actually, but it communicates, it sends the message until you are able to really get a grip of what he's talking about. Now, he also had an extraordinary ability to convey a sense of specific time. And so if you missed our previous lesson, this is something more about Lawrence, okay? Lawrence's style is quite um, sensual. So when you read the poem, you see that some of the lines are relatable and they also appeal to the senses. Now his writings often reflected his complex personality, of course. And so if you didn't look at the poem but, and you are now looking at the poem but, you will understand all the things that I've mentioned about Lawrence. So fast forward, this is a picture of Lawrence, okay? So if you've never seen him before, that is David Herbert Lawrence. We also took time to look at some of the unfamiliar words, okay? So we started in our previous lesson, let's spell. And today too, we are gonna spell some words and know the meaning of the words. And so we looked at gloom, Glowing, axe, obscure. We also looked at pools, soap, twitch, shudder. So as you have seen the displayed on the screen, I'm sure that you have taken your notebook, you've grabbed your pen, and you are noting down some new words and their meaning. And so if we say spools, spools, then we are talking about quell something that has spools is quelled up or it moves okay if you look at soup 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 and so when i say that the bird soup over the fence it means the bird jumped over the fence or the bird flew down over the fence and so that is soup Switch is also there, shadow is also there. And then we looked at the summary of the poem. And so in our previous lesson, we learned that the poem but, okay, centers on the poise and difference to the creature but. When we see that something is indifferent, then we are talking about the fact that the poet had a certain perception, a certain form of dislike for the animal bat. Now he tells how he was sitting on the terrace somewhere in Florence, Italy, beyond Pesa. And so a quick summary of the poem points to the fact that he was seated somewhere. He saw the animal bat fly in the sky and while he looked at it, he felt quite uncomfortable. He felt, why is this bat just hovering over my head? I don't like it. That is how he felt. And because he didn't really like the bat, he chose to write the poem that we are studying today. Now, he again marvels at the exact nature of flying objects in general and he says that like a glove a black glove one thrown up at the light and so today in let's spell a word you are going to know the meaning of the word glove okay good now also according to the poet Lawrence David Herbert Okay, he feels that birds are wildly vindictive. And if we say something is vindictive, it's vindictive actually has been used in the poem. And so if you describe an animal 
as being wildly vindictive, what does it mean? Don't worry, you will discover it very soon. And he also says that the bat gives a sense of fright. A sense of fright. Now they don't just swoop, according to him, but fly madly, causing an easy creeping in one's scalp. Now, according to David Herbert Lawrence, if you are seated somewhere and the animal bat hovers over your head, it's quite uncomfortable. Now, in the local setting, let me bring it contextually to a situation in Ghana, okay? Now, growing up as a little girl, when I used to get to 37 military hospital, usually you will find the bats hovering all around. People had their own perception about them. Now, the question to be answered is, where are they? We had a lot of bats, but I don't see them anymore. Could we also say that because of the dislike that people had for the bats, the bats have all run away? It's a question to be answered. We are talking about Herbert's dislike for the animal bats, and that led to the poem that we are studying today. And so we can also say that he even seems to consider whether the creatures, okay, uh, he considers them as little lumps <laughs> that fly in the air and their wings as bits of the umbrella. And so you see how the umbrella actually looks like, okay. I think in our previous lesson, I showed you a picture of a bat. I should have done the same today. Don't worry, um, Google, go to the internet and then you'll find a pictorial representation of how a bat look like. And so those days there were a lot of bats at the 37 military hospital where the trees were. Now, Herbert says that when they sleep, that is the bats. They look like rows of disgusting old rocks. How can you describe an animal like that? And so in summary, we say that he, he compares them, how people love animals to how he dislikes the animals or how others dislike it. And so you get to understand and see in some lines of the poem that Whilst in China, they are excited, they are happy. Anytime they see a bat, on his part, seeing a bat, feeling the presence of the bat even around, this organizes him. Okay? He feels that the bat even disorganizes his thoughts and disorganizes everything around him. Now, what are our objectives for today? Our objectives for today is to identify the structure of the poem. We did a lot in the previous lesson based on what you have seen. Today, we want to look at the structure. How many lines are in the poem? What are the literary devices that are present in the poem? What sense does it connote? What message has been sold out? We are going to discover all of that today. Now, get up from your seat, pick your phone, send a message to your friends, call them. If you are in the car, you can equally call. Let them grab their notebooks and pen and tell them it is time to enjoy literature here on Joy Learning. Okay, good job. Relax and let's go on to Let's Spell a Word. And so in Let's Spell a Word today, our first word is serrated. Is word serrated. So serrated. Serrated. Now what does it mean when we say serrated? Okay, serrated means 
jugged. And so you hear somebody say that, oh, he has jugged the thing. Jack, I want to describe it. So the thing standing, pointed, okay? So another meaning for serrated is pointed. Another meaning for serrated is rough. Another meaning to for serrated is sharp. And we are going to identify how the word serrated was used in the poem. We have realized serrated means jagged, pointed, rough, sharp. And then we have wavering, okay? What is the word again? Whisper it out. Good job. Wavering. And wavering means that undecisive, okay? It also means that uncertain. It also means uncommitted. And it also means irresolute. So, I'm quite wavering about the situation. What does it mean? You are uncertain, you are uncommitted, you are undecisive, and you are irresolute. And it's been used in the poem. We also have our next word that we are spelling is disgusting. And you know usually, <laughs> the way the word disgusting is pronounced actually, okay? The way that disgusting is pronounced is actually how it looks. So you see people use the word disgusting and it's evident. Nobody says disgusting. Nobody ever says disgusting smiling. Disgusting. You get it? So disgusting means filthy. It can also mean nauseating. So sometimes you hear, oh, oh, this is disgusting. So you are nauseated and you feel like vomiting because the thing is disgusting. Um, horrible. So if something is also disgusting, it means the thing is horrible and then revolting. So another word which also requires a meaning is revolting and revolting means disgusting it also means filthy nauseating and horrible is it working are you enjoying the lesson you can take some water and start sipping okay and relax and let's enjoy and then grinning Beaming, smiling, laughing, smiking. That is also in the poem, grinning. And then we have vindictive, vindictive. And if somebody or something um, is being vindictive, then the person is quite mean, the person is bitter, the person is malicious, the person is spiteful. Spiteful, malicious, bitter, mean okay and then creeping creeping so when you're creeping you see we have um the creeping plants have you seen or heard about the creeping plants so the creeping plants usually you see it grow and even climb around the house if it's a tree you see that the plants will just you know wrap around it so we call that creeping and we say the creeping can also mean tiptoeing so you are tiptoeing or you are sneaking you see how it is when you're sneaking and then sidling as well as stealing of course when you are stealing you don't go straight you still you look around you creep a little and then you take it that is the end of our let's spell a word today and these words are all evidence in our poem, okay? So, we look at serrated, wavering, disgusting, greening, vindictive, and creeping. Good job. Now, let's move to the poem, and then we start looking at the structure. 
Toronto but by Lawrence David at evening sitting on the stars when the sun from the west beyond Pisa beyond the mountains of Carrara departs and the world is taken by surprise when the tired flower of Florence is in gloom beneath the glowing brown hill surrounding when under the eggs of the pond's vitreo a green light enters against stream flash from the west against the current of obscure anil look up and you'll see things flying between the day and the night swallowed with pools of dark thread sewing the shadows together a circle swoop and a quick parabola under the bridge X, where light pushes through a sudden turning upon itself of a thing in the air a dip to the water and you think the swallows are flying so late swallows dark air life looping yet missing the pure loop a switch a twitter an elastic shudder in flight and serrated wings against the sky so this is our word what color do we use let's use green serrated so don't forget that when we were looking at let's spell a word we came across serrated like a glove a black glove thrown up at the light and falling back never swallows bats the swallows are gone at a wavering instant and swallows give way to bats so wavering okay don't forget we also looked at the word wavering let's use red here changing god but an uneasy creeping in one's skull. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we also looked at the word creeping. And an easy creeping in one's skull. Don't forget that we said when something is creeping, it's what? Tiptoeing, it's stealing. Mm -hmm. Good. It's sidling. All right. As the bat soup overheard we also saw the meaning of soup in our previous lesson and we saw that soup is what fly down flying madly perpetrello black pipe on an infinite smell pipe let all lamb that fly in air and have voices indefinite wildly vindictive so we came across the word vindictive as well Wings like bits of umbrella. Bats, creatures that hang themselves up like an old rack to sleep and disgustingly upside down. How can you describe an animal as disgustingly upside down? Hanging upside down like rows of disgusting old racks and grinning in their sleep. It's amazing, right? How can a bat smell in the sleep? In China, the bat is symbol for happiness. Not for me. Not me, oh. Lawrence. <laughs> All right. So we said greening means what? Quickly, before we look at the structure, we said greening means what? Mm hmm. Smile. Mm hmm. So because it's in the continuous, our meaning should also be in the continuous, right? Okay, good job. So smiling, smiking. Mm-hmm. We said this gassing is what? Filthy, revolting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then we also saw what? Creeping. And we said creeping is what? Stealing. Based on the context. So bath and an easy creeping in one scalp. Now let's quickly come here. 
in this case, which of the words are we going to use to replace um, creeping in the poem? I think we can go for sneaking, right? The birds don't tiptoe. Mm -hmm. Can they tiptoe in the air? Okay. But it can sneak. They can sideline, okay? Sideline, sideline. And then uh, we know vindictive to be malicious. We know beaming, okay, for the greening. All right. So now that we know the meaning of these words, okay, which one did we say we were taking? Sideline. All right. Vindictive. We said vindictive is what? Mm hmm. Spiteful. Okay. Good job. And then wavering. Wavering. We said wavering means what? Quickly look at it. Wavering means what? Indecisive, uncertain, uncommitted. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Good job. And so, out of the words that we started with, let's spell a word, okay? Now we have seen how the words have been used in the poem. We came across serrated, and we said serrated means what? Pointed. We also said it meant what? Sharp. It also meant what? Rough. Now, in this case, which of the meanings actually fits in the poem? And serrated wings against the sky. So we can say, and sharp wings against the sky. Or, and pointed wings against the sky. And so all the meanings that we've identified actually fits in the poem, right? Good job. All right. Now, from all we've done, we've looked at the poem. We've looked at the meaning of the poem. What I want you to do now is to take your time together with me and let's identify the structure of the poem. How many lines do we have? Don't forget, when we're looking at poetry in general, we looked at the structure. We said we would look at the number of lines whether the lines are run on or end stop, we will identify whether the lines are monostitch. Mm -hmm. You remember where monostitch line is? Okay. Whether the lines are couplets, you remember that one too? Whether the words are tacits, do you remember that one too? Good. Mm -hmm. So we mentioned all these when we're looking at poetry in general. Now let's quickly go to the poem and look at the structure. So we are going to count together to know the number of lines that we can identify in the poem, okay? So let's go. One, two, mm -hmm. let's count together. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, mm-hmm. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. Twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, forty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-five. How many lines do we have in the poem, but so let's write here. So but the poem of 45 lines. 
Good job. Now the next thing we are going to look at is the number of stanzas. So but is a poem of how many lines? 45 lines. We counted together. Now let's look at the stanzas, okay? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. And so bad is a poem. But is a poem of 18 stanzas. Or we can say it's an 18 stanza poem. Now we are going to go back to the poem and check whether the stanzas are even or uneven. So let's go back. Okay, so let's start. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the first stanza. How many lines do we have in the first stanza? Write it down. Good. The second stanza. Good. The third stanza. Good. The fourth stanza. Good. The fifth stanza. Well done. Sixth, seventh. Eight, ninth, tenth, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I'm seeing one stanza line. Are you also seeing it? I'll teach you what the one stanza line poem means. Okay, okay, okay. Good. Now the question to be answered is a poem of eight in stanzas. Why do we have a whole stanza being just a word or one line? That is to tell you that a poem can have just one line stanza. And a one line stanza poem is called a monostage. It's called what? A monostage. Monostage. As in you are sewing. Okay? So one stanza poem, one stanza line, one stanza line. Okay, all right. And when the lines are two, we call it couplets. We call it what? Couplets. Again, couplets. Good job. Okay. Now, what are the words that are actually entailed in these stanzas? Now, let's go to the analysis that I've done as we look at the structure. Now, before we look at the analysis, okay, I came out with a theme. We are going to skip the theme. After we've looked at the analysis, I'm expecting that you, my learners, will be able to identify the theme on your own. And so, yay, we are right, you and I. So when we counted the number of lines, we identify that Bad is a 45 line poem with no exact stanzic structure. Mm -hmm. Stanzic structure. That is to tell you that some of the lines are tassets. So a tasset um, line is just three lines. Some of the lines are monostitch, and monostitch is just one line. Some of the lines are couplets, and that is two lines. I'm sure there are quatrains. So quatrains, four lines. Did you see any sextas in the six lines? I'm not sure, but we can go back to it, okay? I hope now you have the poem. Because my first yes, it is mandatory that you start looking at all the poems. Now, the poem is written in which way? It's a free verse. It doesn't follow in a rigid rule, okay? So whether you, it's not, it's not a Shakespearean sonnet, a romantic sonnet, or whatever. It is just a free verse. No rule. 
nothing binds it. Now, each stanza is not made of the same number of lines. I'm sure you identify that as well, because we did it together. Now, some are one word, but, and that is a, st a stanza, okay? Or line that makes up a stanza. And so you can find a stanza with just a word. Now, you don't have to be surprised. When you are analyzing the poem, when you are looking at the structure of a poem, okay? Like the structure of a human being, like me. My eyes are different from my nose, okay? My mouth is different from my neck. The same way in some poems, the structure is not the same. You don't find the lines following a certain pattern. That if it's three, it's just three, 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 three. If it's five, it's just five, 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 five. If it's an octave, it's eight, 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 eight. Okay, good job. And so this poem, we can say that it is a, say that again, free verse. Good. Now, do you remember that we also identified the poem has how many stanzas? 18 stanzas. Clap for yourself. We did it together, you and I. In all the poem is written in 18 stanzas, with each stanza containing a variety of lines. I think I've explained that, and that is good, right? Good. Now, let's take our time and look at the first stanza of the poem. Okay. Quickly, let's go back. Good. There we go. So we have the first stanza. This is the first stanza of Lawrence's poem. At evening, sitting on those tires, when the sun from the west beyond Pesa, beyond the mountains of Carrara, departs, and the world is taken by surprise. That is a stanza. Then you come and see a couplet. So I've mentioned a couplet. So the first is a tacit, three lines. The second is a couplet, okay? You can read further about all the things I've men I'm mentioning. Then we meet another tacit, three lines, okay? Then another tacit. Then we meet a what? A quatrine, four lines. Then we meet another couplet. Then we meet one line. And I said one line is what? Monostitch. So the monostitch, even if it's just a word on a line, is still a monostitch, okay? Then we meet one, two, three, four, five, six. That's part of your assignments. Go and find out. I said this when I was teaching at the beginning. I said a poem of six lines is called a sestix, okay? Sestix. That's a poem of six lines. It's called a sex test. Now, never swallows but The swallows are gone. And so we see another tacit here. Mm -hmm. We see another tacit over there. Okay, my learners. Auntie has gone beyond what we are looking at. Good. Yeah, we are back on track. All right. So we saw that the first stanza is made up of three lines. The second stanza contains just two lines. I explained to you what those lines meant. The third stanza has three lines. Line 34 is a one-line stanza and also known as a... Monostage, I mentioned that earlier, and so on and so forth. And so as we go on, and as you studied already, I'm sure you've realized the lines are uneven. The lines are what? Uneven. Good job. Now, is your turn, is my turn. We are still looking at the structure of the poem, okay, in our analysis. Let's look at the literary devices present in there, okay? 
So one of the devices that we can talk about is what we term as metonymy. It's called what? Metonymy. Now the persona of this poem, so I've taught you what persona is to be for. I said, persona is the voice you hear as you read the poem. The voice you hear as you read the poem. That is persona. The persona of this poem uses several literary devices to convey his shifting perceptions of the natural world. And so, you see, he will talk about something here, then he will go and talk about something there, all pointing at the natural world. Now, unlike some people, the persona finds the creatures vindictive. So the speaker employs metonymy by writing that the world is taken by surprise. How can the world be taken by surprise? That is metonymy. While his focus is on the natural world in this poem, the world here comes to represent the reaction of all of the people in the world. Okay, and so when you are looking at, so we have a device called Senegdoke. Some people will say Senegdochi, okay? So whether it's Senegdoke or Senegdochi, what does it mean? Using a part to represent a whole. That is Senegdoke. That's what I would have taught me. But time has evolved. And so if your teachers are pronouncing it as senegdochi, then let's see and learn from them as well. And so in using a part to represent a whole, that we can term that as senegdoche. Now metonymy also plays the same role as senegdoche. It, it also uses the part to represent a whole. So here we see the world is taken by surprise. Now the world here comes to represent the reaction of the people. Okay. So you hear people say the world is amazed at you. How is the world amazed at you? Okay. All right. Other devices that we can see in the poem is metaphor and alliteration. Now you'll be wondering why I have metaphor and I have alliteration all on the same line. Quickly for us to just go through. Metaphor plays a role. Alliteration also plays a role. Don't forget we learned that metaphor is what? Direct comparison. Okay? Direct comparison between two dissimilar things without the use of as or like. Without the use of as or like. And so I can say, she is a pen. She is a pen. That is metaphorical, okay? I'm comparing she to a pen. What has the pen done? Maybe the pen is slender, is slim. Maybe the pen <laughs> is floated. And so she's represented the pen. I'm comparing. She is, mama is a sunrise. Perfect. Mama is a sunrise. Comparing mama to the sunrise, two opposite things, comparing them without the use of as or like. And then we learn that alliteration is the repetition of the same consonant sounds. Don't forget, repetition of the same consonant sounds in close succession. And so here, there are some examples of metaphor. There are also examples of alliteration. All in the poem, but okay good job and so let's see now in line four 
when the tide flies of Florence in the gloom beneath. So here we are not only finding metaphor, we are also finding personification, okay? So we can also find personification here. Okay? Mm -hmm. When the, how can it, a flowers be tied that has given human attributes to non-human entity? And so we get personification there. Okay? Flower of Florence. So we get another device there. And that's what? So here the repetition of the four. Flower, Florence. I made you understood that when we have repetition of the same consonant. Repeat that after me. Consonant. I know you say consonant. Don't say consonant again. Consonant. So the repetition of the same consonant sounds. So we have the consonant sound f in flowers and f in Florence. And that gives us what? Alliteration. Good job. All right, now he also compares Florence to a tide flower. Mm -hmm. And I just compared mama to the sunrise. And I said, when you say mama is a sunrise, we term that as what? Metaphor. Okay, metaphor, direct comparison. Mama and sunrise are two different things. But the moment you say, Mama is like a sunrise, then what device is that? Simile. Good job. And so we are looking at the use of metaphor in this line. And here we have Florence. When the tide flower of Florence, okay? Tide flower of Florence. Now the tide flower gives us a different device. That's what I mentioned earlier. I said it's what? Personification. But where you have tired flower of Florence, then we are illustrating both the beauty of the city and the weariness, okay? Worry, you know, worry, tiredness, okay? In the close of day. That's beautiful, right? And so in the poem, we have identified one device already. We saw metonymy. We've looked at what metonymy is, and then we are seeing metaphor, we have seen alliteration, and what else are we seeing? Symbolism. Say that, symbolism. Now here, um, the poet delays many symbols in the poem, okay? So, but um, Lawrence makes use of nature and creatures from nature as a symbol. Right, so he, he describes, he gives you a mental representation of all the things happening. Mm -hmm. He uses things to give a symbol, a symbol. He, he talks about the wings of the bat and compares it to something else, as, as to the umbrella, good job. And so you see that and you're like, okay, what symbol is that? Can I find that out? What is the poet trying to connote? And so we see symbolism. Hello there. Breathe in. Out. In. Out. Well done. Now let's continue. What devices have we identified in the poem? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. With by loud. I want somebody to hear you in the house or in the car. Mm-hmm. Good job. Now, let's move away and come to diction, okay? Now, what is the diction of the poem? So, when we talk about diction, we are talking about the choice of words, the use of language, okay? Diction, the use of language. Now, the poet uses language Okay, the poet's use of language is quite simple. I think most of the words are words that we've come into contact with. They are words that we have heard of, okay? And so, the poet's use of language is very simple. 
and he adopts the use of conversational. Let's see something quickly here. Are you here with me? Good, 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 good. At evening, sitting on this terrace, when the sun from the west, beyond Pisa, beyond the mountains of Carrara, departs. And the world is taken by surprise. When the tide flower of Florence is in gloom beneath the glowing brown hills surrounding. When under the eggs of the Pontificio, a green light enters against stream, flash from the west, against the current of obscure anu. Look up. So there's a form of conversation, okay? The persona is talking to you too. Look up. And you see things flying between the day and the nights, swallows with spools of dark thread sewing the shadows together, a circle swoop. And so you see the conversation, okay? That's the conversation that we see them. And so the poet makes use of conversation in the poem. That's addiction. Now let's quickly. Um, glance through our themes, okay? I skipped that. I said we will look at it before I go. We are not looking at Bath again. And so, this assignment is for you, okay? I expect you to go and read further as I talk about the theme so that any time you meet a question on the poem Bath, you'll be able to answer it. Is it good? Good job. And so we can see the theme of absurd prejudice. What does it mean, Auntie Jima? So prejudice, have you heard of pride of prejudice? Mm-hmm. I still don't understand. Okay. So prejudice can be a form of dislike, okay? So we say that unreasonable dislike, absurd. Crazy does like you, you have no reason, you just don't like things. So unreasonable does like for mammals, for animals, and that's what is pictured in the poem. And not just in the poem, you can also see it in his other poems. So in other poems of Lawrence, so when you talk about the poem Snake by Lawrence over there, he says that he throws a log at a snake. Not because he wants to, but because people generally dislike snakes. I know what a log is, right? A wood or a stick. So we see unreasonable dislike. Some people just don't like cats. Some people don't like dogs. Some people like some people I know, like myself. I don't like dogs. I'm afraid of dogs. Okay. And so some people will also not like cats. Others would just not like fowl, but it is the fowl. That's absurd, right? Okay, so we see absurd, crazy, unreasonable, dislike for animals. We also see the theme of admiration for nature. And I think that's my favorite. If you look at how the poem opens, okay, how the persona, the voice in the poem, just sits somewhere and says, at evening, sitting on the terrace, when the sun from the west, beyond Persia, beyond the mountains, when the tide flower of Florence is in gloom, beneath the glowing. You know the glowing? That is beneath the glowing. So here, the persona was talking about nature, describing nature. What do you see in the evening? When you relax and you take a seat to sit outside, you will see what? The sun from the worst dying out, entering for the moon to come out. And when that happens, the tired flies, all the tired things go to bed. Have you ever seen a goat at dawn? They sleep as well. Have you ever seen a bird at dawn? Mm, they sleep, they all get tired, okay? So we see the poet admiring nature. And the final theme I identified was the theme of the right to individual preference. Where do we see that theme? Now, getting to the latter part of the poem, the last stanza, 
Okay, you see that the persona says that in China, I think I'll go to China soon. In China, they have admiration. They are happy about the bat. Not for me, not for the persona. And so the right to individual preference. Hello, my learners. From all that we have studied today, we've looked at um, spell a word. We spelled some word. We came across serrated. We came across vindictive, disgusting. What else did we come across? A lot of words today. We identified those words in the poem. We looked at how it's been used in the poem as well. We took our time to read the poem, but now we came to analyze it by looking at the structure of the poem. We said, but is a poem of 45 lines. We also saw that but has 18 stanzas. So the poem but has got 18 stanzas. We also realized the lines are uneven and the poem is a free verse. We also discovered the diction, the style, the use of language in the poem. And we discovered that the words are quite simple. Well then, and then hmm, we looked at some devices as well. We came across metonymy, metaphor, alliteration, personification, symbolism. And finally, we looked at some themes that are evident in the poem. We saw the theme of absurd prejudice. We also saw the theme of love, admiration for nature. And we looked at the theme of the rights of preference. So while somebody will not like something, the other person will like it. The moral lesson in the poem that we have studied today is going to be Jimmy's lines for you as you live in your house, as you stay at home, as you encounter with other people. And so Jimmy's lines for today, what does it say? Let's quickly write it together. Okay. Hmm, Jimmy's line says that Okay, so Jimmy's lines for today says that acceptance differs but converges at a point. Accept all. What does it mean? By accepting other people or other things might differ from how you look at things and how you accept them. But at the end of the day, we all meet at a point and get to understand that the way you will see the television might be different from the way I will see it. But at the end of the day, accepting the way you see it, and I accepting the way I also see mine, and we meeting at a point to appreciate our uniqueness brings out the best. And so hello there, my learners. As you go to school, when your friends make a point, just accept it. Opinions, that's their opinion, okay? And so, this is your assignment. Ben Sipolas. There are other poems for us to look at, okay? We have to look at the good moral. We have to look at the journey of the Magi. We have to look at Ben Sipolas. Don't worry, we will look at all of them before you write your exams. You are in first year, don't worry. 
even though you are going to second year. And so your assignment, Christmas assignment, is to look at Benzipolis by G. M. Hopkins, identify the structure of the poem, and then analyze the poem. I'm sure you can do that based on all that we have done. Hello, hello, hello. All so soon, the lesson has come to an end. It's when senior high school are here on Joy Learning. Don't forget, accept others and accept yours. And we meet at a point. Enjoy the rest of the day and stay blessed. It's been time with Jamal Labi here on Joy Learning Channel. Bye bye. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.